Now, are we going to wait and see uh, if, if anybody else is coming along, or do you want me to kind of, you know, get started, and we'll, we'll start walking around, and I'll show everybody the place. Hopefully, we'll keep our, uh, our connection going, and then we're going to take some time. Um, I'll tell you all about what, what we do here at Hook and Ladder. Yeah, and, and um, I, I often do uh, a, um, an introduction, but I think that uh, you introduced yourself, Devin, in that <laughs> hook and ladder. Uh, I, I came from the fire industry, as we discussed last time, so, so people will be interested to know why you're called that. And, uh, and I have uh, the hook and ladder wines in my cellar, the, the, the Tillerman and the, the Station 10, uh, that are quite amazing. Ah, oh, there's Sandra. Hello. <laughs> and... Um, and so, so why don't you take it, take it, and if I need to fill any gaps at the end, I certainly will. You got it. Yeah. All right. I'm Devin from Hook and Ladder Winery. Um, I have personally been at this winery a lot of my life now. So uh, I actually started my first crush. Uh, I was 20 years old. I was not of, of age here in the United States. I had just spent about six months in, uh, in France uh, where I was of age and I was able to enjoy in, uh, in the wine culture um, out there quite a bit. Came back here and had a lot of interest um, in where I grew up. I grew up in Sebastopol, California. Uh, Sebastopol, California is about 15 minutes away from the coast. The, the closest coastline is what we would call Bodega Bay. Um, this would be where you've got kind of a very large ABA that, that defines itself in different ways, where Sonoma Coast, uh, if you've had Sonoma Coast wine, some really lovely stuff that comes out of there as well. But we're uh, actually just on the other side of the, the mountain range. Um, and so Sebastopol, where I grew up, is part of the Russian River Valley, where I work. Um, I now, you know, am up in Mendocino County but a little further north as far as where I reside, but I've always called this my, my work home. So for, uh, since, since 2000, gosh, I'm 2007, I've been, uh, I've been with, with hook and ladder 2006 really. And, um, and I've gotten to do a little bit of everything. So starting in the cellar was, uh, was just fantastic and, and, and really kind of upped my knowledge and my, acquaintance with, uh, with fruit, um, and with the kind of grape to glass, uh, uh, timeline and uh, process. And, uh, and then when I got more into kind of sales, I mean, to be honest, it's a lot of hard work out there. Uh, and I, I thought, you know, okay, I'm distracting people with my, my motor mouth out here. Maybe I could go put it to work. And, uh, and when I, when I did that, I started in the tasting room and, uh, and moved my way through until eventually, um, you know, uh, becoming the, the VP of sales. I was, uh, gosh, a year and a half ago. And so now running the national side of things, as well as still the uh, thriving and continuing to grow direct to consumer side of, uh, uh, of, of our winery. And Hook and Ladder is a really unique story. Um, Cecil is our, our kind of founder and owner, Cecil Deloach. Deloach is a big name in Russian River Valley history and wine. They started uh, their first winery in the mid 70s called Deloach Winery and rose to some amazing heights. I mean, was, was doing 300,000 cases of, uh, of wine, owned a, owned a little import uh, business. They did, uh, you know, they had their hands in everything from cognac to, uh, to bubbles that were imported from France to their empire of wine with the Deloach label. Um, but amazingly, and I was telling this story to somebody today, amazingly at the time, uh, he, he found about 24 and a half acres of Zinfandel in a three bedroom house in 1969 while he was still fighting fire with uh, the San Francisco Fire Department. He decided that, uh, you know, eventually he would like to, to, to have a little hobby vineyard, but also to retire in the country. Um, so that, that land in 1969, which was a lot of money back then, cost him about 77 grand. So when you really fast forward, to where we are now, um, it was just, it was truly such a different time in that, in that respect. So he was a firefighter. That was his career, bought fire for about 20 years. And, uh, and yet, you know, uh, starting at that, that time when it was, you know, pun intended, ripe for the picking, um, you know, Sonoma County, you could have people that were, were, were teachers, were, were firefighters, were, and get into the vineyard side of things and potentially become legendary. And, uh, and that's exactly, you know, exactly what happened with, with Cecil. He was on the back of a hook and ladder truck 
uh, for many of his years in, in San Francisco. So when we get to the seller selection that, uh, that, that Jane has and, and one of my favorite wines, the Tillerman, that is a reference, a direct reference to who steers the back of the hook and ladder. And that's what Cecil did, right? So um, he retired out of Station 10, which is Presidio and Bush in, in San Francisco. So that kind of is where you're going to at least get that first tie in to hook and ladder, what it means to us. We have an incredible uh, first responding community that uh, has maybe meant more to us as we walk outside. You'll, you'll probably see some of that, unfortunately, but may, meant more to us since 2017 than I think anybody here ever, ever knew it would. Um, but uh, but it's, it's really a fun thing. I, when I first got started, I said, firefighters and wine, what, you know? And then actually, <laughs> I, I gotta say, these are, these are men and women that are, are very gourmet. They love to cook. They have uh, an incredible, uh, I think, uh, respect for culinary arts, uh, for Epicurious things and uh, craft, uh, a craft beer, wine, um, uh, distill spirits. I've had many lively conversations with, uh, with the firefighters that, uh, that support hook and ladder here. Uh, so being in the Russian River Valley, we are a cooler climate for, and I'm going to take you on a little walk from here. So if, if uh, we do end up, you know, having a little breaking connection, I'm sure uh, you can holler at me, but uh, we'll wait for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> come. okay, good. I'll come right back, I promise. But a little cooler climate. And right now, when we walk outside, I'm gonna just show you what's going on. Um, we have a twofold right now. Unfortunately, guys, we have a lot of smoke in our area. Um, just to, to kind of give you a little context to what that is. We've got about 350 fires raging through California. Um, a lot of them were started by a dry lightning storm that was unlike anything I've ever seen and uh, have just kind of inundated uh, much of the state with, uh, along with some really, really high heat. And, uh, and so what we've, we've got is a, a, a combination of quite a few fires that have, uh, at this point, led to less of the real hazardous smoke that is, is, is on the ground level and is, is really quite, quite a far up there in the atmosphere. And it's creating a, a kind of an eerie look out here. But we also have what is very common to us at this time, which is some of these fog layers. And uh, just over the hills, where, where if you can see through, this is our Sauvignon Blanc vineyard, but just over the hills there, that is kind of, fog will just roll over there. They just kind of blanket over from those hills and into this valley, which is so important for our Chardonnay in Russian, in, in Russian River Valley and our Pinot Noir. Those burgundy varietals, which are, huge to the, the, the community of, uh, of wineries that we're in um, have really become world renowned because of some of this uh, cool fog layer that can extend the ripening period and yet still give an even process for, uh, for those two varietals specifically that often um, are just a little easy, it's a, a little more affected, if you will. I mean, they, they are impacted by warmer heat spikes, uh, changes to the weather. So luckily um, for much of my time, we've had uh, nothing but, uh, but, but those types of uh, conditions in summers. However, obviously, uh, you know, there, every, every vintage does pose challenges. We had some record heat. Um, <laughs> Anais was just telling me it's, it's winter time. I just want to let you know. So I took, I just took my this anecdotally, you know, digression. Uh, I took my family out to this little, uh, a place called Safari West, really cool little spot. And, um, and, uh, <laughs> it was 110, 110 two days ago. Um, so obviously that is not normal. However, uh, was the case and uh, has been in contribution to uh, some of the fires that we're facing here. But um, here we are. This is our beautiful grounds where, um, you know, luckily we've been able to, to host people in a, a socially distanced and, and very health conscious way. Um, everything we do right now is outside. So when it comes to visitation, yes, we are open. We have um, capacity limits. And then, of course, we have our social distancing 
uh, requirements and uh, everything right now is, is, uh, is done out here on this grounds. And we're really lucky. Some of our, uh, our neighbors, you know, don't have this ability or, or doing urban tasting rooms. And of course, plenty of, of, of the folks that I know in, in, in the restaurant industry don't have uh, of all of this to avail themselves of as well. And so in that case, we are, we're really lucky. We're on about 20 acres right here and uh, the four and a half acres of Sauvignon Blanc that you see now behind me. And then we have, uh, actually it's just over about 13 planted acres of Chardonnay um, kind of on the other side. But if you do ever make it on out, um, you've got a great place to, to come and stay a while. And, uh, and we, we do hope we've seen Opinion Society members down here over the years. Um, and it's really, really fun when we do. Now that I know kind of how much, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we have been partnered with Opinion over the years, it's really uh, more and more uh, important for us to, to extend that and say, hey guys, we'd love to see you out here and uh, always take good care of uh, Opinion Society members. We treat Opinion Society like one members, so always comp those types of things if you let us know and um, we'll, we'll be there with you. But, uh, you can, can, can you hear me, Devin? Hey, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. next next year, when when things are a little better for travel, uh, we're we're gonna have a very robust travel program, and California is on the list. And uh, when we get to California, oh, we'll be bringing a bunch to you. Great. This is our little night. Uh, what sixty three Willie's G. Uh, one of the kind of beacons where when we are open, it'll either out be in front of the, the vineyard or uh, or parked out here. And uh, from here, I'm going to show you just a little bit of uh, kind of the cellar, hopefully uh, uh, one of my favorite little features. But, um, oh, this is kind of, this is this is cool. This is their, this is the Delosius first press. Uh, I mean, honestly, this is this is the basket press that they, they used in the early 70s um, to make, their their house wine but um we still have it uh, it's not in working condition we do not use it but uh, but we do have uh their first basket press there and from here i'm going to kind of show you a little bit uh if you want to know what this is this is an old these are older tanks it's just a, a spray on foam insulation it used to be very popular in the 70s and 80s um and since we are Somewhat outside with these stainless steel fermenters, and we've got some big ones here. We also um, are we're farmers at heart, still owning about 142 planted acres. We sell fruit, but we also uh, we also will do custom crush for people as well. So we do have quite a bit of tank space. You see, all of our harvest equipment is is out. Um, so a couple of presses. Uh, these guys not working late today, but have been doing so quite often. And, um, and we've got a lot of full tanks right now, the hopper there. Um, so we've got like all the crush equipment going and one of my favorite parts is to go on up the catwalk here. And see, you can see we got some good tank space. So uh, we will, like I said, make other, other people's wine um, when the opportunity is right. And, uh, and then bottle it up for them and you know, whether that be kind of hobby stuff or people that are selling. But I do wish that it was a little nicer day because we do have just quite a gorgeous view from here um, overlooking our vineyard and grounds, um, Chardonnay behind us. And over there to the Northeast, in fact, I'll point over, even though we can't see it. That's where Chalk Hill is. So when we get to, a little more of the tasting portion. We'll talk about that uh, area and just how different that is. Why in some ways it defines what we do because, you know, we're able to, to grow Bordeaux varietals with a, a, a really great potential and uh, consistency there. So that uh, I'll talk about in a little while, but right here, this is heart of Russian River Valley. Now, finally, this could be where my connection gets a little bit wonky, but we'll we'll hope that it uh, stays. He was any right. Questions? There, oh, yeah. there you are. You're back. <laughs> Am I back? You're back. Okay. 
All right. So, um, boy, here you can just get the off-gassing immediately. So I've got uh, a lot of good CO2 going. So if I faint, guys, just call, call the authorities. <laughs> uh, so we do all of our Pinot Noir. You guys see that? Does everybody see that? Yeah, very cool. Yeah, so all of our Pinot Noir is done in open top fermenters. So these are smaller uh, open top fermenters. When I first got here, we didn't have that hydraulic press. We actually got on two by fours and we did, I mean, all of this with a very small punch down device. So now we have this mnemonic, uh, uh, you know, press is still all by hand, but um, yeah, every bit of our Pinot Noir sees open top by hand, kind of a more old world approach. But when I started, we used to get on uh, two by fours and use this. And that, we would do that for every bit of our Pinot. Um, you know, in total, upwards of 7,000 cases. So that was, that was the hard work I was telling you about. I was in a better shape back then. So and for the benefit of others, Devin, do you want to explain what punch down does with, uh, with uh, getting that back, getting it circulating? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so during these, uh, these punch downs, a uh, very important time to uh, keep the cap wet, uh, where you can, if that cap gets, uh, gets dry, a lot of microbacterial action can, can happen. It can really affect the wine in a negative way. But what uh, else it's really doing is, is getting really intense skin contact, and we're driving all of that color, some of that tannic uh, uh, element from those skins and we're driving that into the wine in primary fermentation and making a usually a much uh, more robust style if you will because of it um, so this uh, is a really really important thing for the style of Pinot Noir that we want to make um, you know you'll see those close top fermenters the same concept is used it's just not by hand we but we, we would do pump overs so it's just what it sounds I mean a pump uh, takes the juice from the bottom, wets the cap, and, uh, and, and you know, that's, that's the process. But much of our wine, if at all possible, and this will also be for cabs and Merlots, depending on the year, if, uh, if we can stagger out that, that tank time, that primary fermentation time, we will use as much in our open tops um, as we can because Jason really does prefer the hand punch down method. And, and I'll have another question for you that we get a lot from through member services, especially about California wineries, is have you been using Mega Purple for to, to get uh, deeper color? Absolutely not. Oh uh, boy, good answer. You know, I, my goodness. Uh, it's unfortunate that, that that's an association with, and, and, it, and it's right for me, so I'm not going to sit here and say that, that people don't, uh, don't do this. Um, but you know, there's the, we were talking about, you know, technology and, and, and California being a, an industry leader, but there are the adverse effects, right? The things that California has done in, uh, in a way to monetize and to, uh, to market wine, uh, and, and things that have no business being in wine. We are absolutely, uh, the, the type of winery that is actually pushing for, um, a, a full list of ingredients. So we have a little, little coalitions of, uh, of smaller wineries that have no, no problem listing, uh, listing all the ingredients. But unfortunately, there are quite a few very large players that would not necessarily uh, uh, love to do that because of things that you, you've mentioned. So no, we do not have any artificial coloring uh, of our wine. When it comes to even our rosé, we've done Signe styles, but uh, we've also, you know, just done, uh, you know, right to right to tank or right right to tank off press, and um, and and we just take the color, right? I mean, you 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 hope for the best always, but yeah. uh, that type of manipulation, it, it has to be done, you know, by hand for us to believe in it. Right. Good job. And, and uh, Kim Chen was asking about Mega Purple as well and what it is. And I think you've, you've described it. It's, it's an artificial colorant. And, and then just the difference between Russian River and the rest of California, uh, what makes it unique. And I think you talked a bit about that as you were showing us the Vista as well. Yeah, so what, what makes Russian River, I think, so unique, even just to our area, right? Um, I, I know that another offering, uh, my good friends over at Blue Rock, right? So there's uh, Carla, who I, I've been in, uh, uh, works 
closely with in, in an association. They're up in Alexander Valley. We also have Dry Creek right next to us as neighbors. All of these AVAs and these boundaries, uh, they're, they're really significant to the microclimates that, uh, that we enjoy. A lot of even in Russian River is split up into neighborhoods. But in the case of Russian River, what makes it so kind of significant is a lot of, uh, of the cool climate that, that, that really kind of drives the long, even growing and ripening phase, perfect for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but could be challenging for things like Cabernet Sauvignon. So uh, yeah, Russian River Valley is, is incredibly unique in that, in that way where some of the coastal elements from Bodega Bay and uh, Chenner and these areas just to the west of us uh, bring layers that, uh, that, that just rest. And often, even in the middle of the summer, you could have fog uh, right on up until about 12 o'clock one, it would be still make for an 85 degree day, a perfect day. But, uh, but you know, the cooling off at night also helps these varietals. So Russian River is really distinct in that way. Um, there's only gonna be so many areas in say, a Napa or even Alexander where uh, a Pinot Noir would be even appropriate to, to, to try and grow. And in Russian River Valley, every single neighborhood, if you will, uh, grows Pinot Noir and goes, grows Pinot Noir to, to, to great effect. So it can tell you a little bit about how, um, I think how special our, our area is as a microclimate, uh, as well as the richness of, of soil. When I grew up in, in Sebastopol, we were actually known for apples. Um, before, before wine, um, we, we, grow, we grew the, the Gravenstein apple, the Gravenstein apple is still celebrated. There's a fair there. Um, however, nobody would, you, you wouldn't even know. I mean, the orchards are no longer there because <laughs> we all realized what, what a special place this was for uh, Pinot Noir and, and Chardonnay. But, uh, but yeah, with the Gravenstein apple, you know, they didn't, they didn't also, uh, they didn't preserve well. So that was a, a challenge for them and a, a quick flash. But, uh, but yeah, agriculturally, this is an incredibly diverse area. Um, for the chefs of the world and, and anybody that's joining us that is, is uh, really curious about uh, uh, culinary endeavors. This is an incredible place once, uh, you know, COVID gets out of the way um, that, that, that really, I mean, some of the, the giants of the culinary scene come and seek out because of just how diverse, how much you can do uh, in season and local and, uh, and then of course, you know, the same, the same respect with wine. I mean, you could have literally a, uh, a, a restaurant that uh, sourced every single thing within a 20 mile radius and was able to uh, provide new and exciting food uh, and wine um, year round. So that, that is really special about this area. One of the reasons I came back uh, was because after uh, extensive traveling, coming back to Sonoma County, I just felt like, man, I've been some really amazing places and this place still stacks up. Uh, it's not necessarily more beautiful, uh, uh, more uh, uh, abundant than some of the other areas, but it surely stacks up to, to, to just about any area I've ever been. And, uh, and that's what, one of the things that I think is so significant about Russian River Valley. So I'm gonna actually take a little sip of our Chardonnay. Um, I love this, this nose. It, it's really kind of begging you to, uh, to take a sip with a lot of this kind of peach and, and fruit forward element. Uh, but then, you know, the, the mouthfeel, the mouthfeel really is where you get a little more classic uh, California Chardonnay. This is a full malolactic fermentation, a nice kind of lemon zest and curd that, that kind of envelops the mouth. And, uh, and just not too much oak. And I think that's a, a really, really important piece to what Jason tries to do with, uh, with the Chardonnay is that uh, you're looking at, you know, something that uh, is really well balanced and, and, and showcases the fruit as the prized possession. Uh, the oak is, is, is definitely there and as a presence to, to add complementary accents to the wine and to, to fully integrate. But it's really about this fruit that we can get out of the Russian River Valley Chardonnay, and we feel like that should be the star. So when it comes to a wine like this, I think there's a range of, uh, of, of pairing options. Uh, what, is the, what is the seller suggestion on this pairing here, Michael? Oh, you're on mute, you're on mute. Yeah, that, that's better, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> you'd think I'd be better at this by now. 
<laughs> uh, lobster risotto with uh, lemon mascarpone. Yeah, you know, was was asking if I was, you know, uh, looking at all of that stuff, and I, I stopped looking at the pairings because I was getting quite hungry. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was sitting there going like, oh, well, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, that would be perfect. That, that would uh, be just an absolutely ideal pairing with a, a wine like this. Um, I think, you know, next I want to move in and just talk a little bit about the Pinot Noir. Um, you know, uh, incredibly important to, to have a stellar Pinot Noir in this area. I think if you don't, uh, you're not long for it. It's just one of those things that's a, a barometer. Um, the fruit has to be good to make great wine. But, uh, but there are, there are what, some winemakers that can get in the way of it. And uh, luckily, we, 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 we actually have six different Pinot Noirs, but this is State Pinot. Probably one of my favorite. Uh, this is, is actually one of the first times that I'm opening the 2018. And it just has that rich strawberry nose, kind of classic little cola elements and, and depth and black cherry on the palate. This is such a fun wine. Um, it has the finesse, it has the restraint that I think people that really, really appreciate Pinot Noir still expect and that sometimes maybe California has gotten away from with, with some of these bigger iterations of, of Pinot. I mean, Michael's gonna ask me about um, other, you know, uh, other things that you may do to wine. You know, do we put Petit Syrah, do we soak Petit Syrah in Pinot? Do we have Zin blended back? No, no, every bit of our Pinot is 100% Pinot. Um, we will make different styles and approaches that, that maybe try and, and invite a cab lover um, to, to try Pinot Noir, but never by, uh, by, by the, uh, the, the expense of the varietal's kind of importance as, as what we feel to be 100% uh, representation. So this is, uh, this is just a, a special area for this type, of, this type of wine. There's little vanilla notes as well. And this is all French oak, about 25% new. So the the one in our um, in our cellar offering right now is the 2018, and is that what you're drinking? Or yeah, I am the uh, the 2018. This is the first time I've had the 2018 since uh, barrel sample. And do you cellar uh, any of your pinots, or are they they for uh, quick drinking, or will you put them down three to five? Yeah, um, I cellar just about everything. I, I yeah. think that that I, and I and I drink them throughout too. But I'm always very interested in the lifeline of, uh, of, of wine. Um, of course, disappointed if I, I go a little bit past the point. But um, I think it, it, since I have a, a, a fair amount of wine and access to wine, and especially, um, you know, have been here since our first, our, our first release of, of Tillerman after the sale of Deloach was a 2003. I still have 2003 Tillerman. We actually uh, drank some of the 2003 Tillerman at a holiday party recently that was just phenomenal. So uh, when it comes to Pinot, though, I, I do think you, you hit it. Uh, it's probably, I, I would say, more recommended in the three to five mm -hmm. as far as laying down. And, uh, and I, I have had five to seven work out very well for me, too. But, and, I, and I like old wine and not everybody does. So, so I would, I'd be delighted at seven years, I'm sure. Um, I've, I've tasted some 09s now that are 11 years old that uh, the winemaker has said they should be drunk in five and I'm still finding them lovely at, at 11, right? That's, uh, and, and it and depends the, on storage too, right? Exactly. So much come, that comes down to the two, two elements that, that you have that many of us just don't, right? I mean, the, 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 the wine fridges that uh, most people have, those are really not designed for cellaring. There's, you know, no humidification. Um, they're, they're mostly designed to serve wine at a, a, a correct temperature. Um, you know, you, you can certainly lay them down in, in those and, and three to five years would be fine. But if you don't have a proper cellar and you're trying to cellar things for decades, um, I, would, I would probably, I would be wary or, uh, or maybe recommend against that. And then the other big point is exactly what you said. Do you like something with a cellar qual quality or do you like something that has, you know, more of that, in this case, really impactful California fruit? Um, you'll get some great integration, uh, a little bit of that kind of tannic age, even to a Pinot like this. Um, we'll, we'll just kind of settle uh, and over time can really, really add to the experience of drinking that wine. But 
it's always, always at the sacrifice of the, the prominence of fruit. I mean, that's good fruit will last and it, it, it may actually show better and more complimentary and not as aggressive. However, if you are somebody and a lot of people that like California wine, they love fruit. And if you're somebody that really likes fruit, say Michael was mentioning his, his wife with Zinn, um, that's why many people don't recommend Zinfandel as a, a big cellaring ca candidate is because of how uh, much fruit. And usually, if you've seen those California Zinn alcohols, how much alcohol <laughs> comes in those things. So, so those two things, if you see high alcohols, I would probably usually, and when I say high alcohols, I'm talking 15%, <laughs> I would usually worry a bit more um, or at least be wary about uh, cellaring for for over three to five years, but um, yeah, so that's that's my long-winded answer of yes, this and, Pinot did very well. And and if you're sending it to Canada, put fourteen point five on the label, please. <laughs> yeah, I will. If fifteen and above, it starts to get really dicey with the LCBO. <laughs> uh, yes. So yeah. So do you want to know the do you want to know the pairing on this on the Pinot? Um, yeah, I want to know crab, crab meat stuffed mushrooms. So we actually did something very similar not too long ago uh, with a Pinot, a Pinot release. So before COVID, and, and I agree, and I, uh, I, I, miss the, I miss the live events. I also think that that's such an important part of wine. I, I truly believe this. I've never had, and, and some people may, may, may differ with me on this, but I've never had a, a bottle that I will remember in my top 10 experiences with wine alone. And so one of the things that I, I really, really, just as much as food pairing or anything matters is, is the company you're, you're, you're keeping at that time and the appreciation for great wine. And that's one of the things that I think is, is truly disappointing about COVID um, is about the, the, the celebratory nature, uh, nature that, that often wine has, or at the very least, um, the intellectual nature or, or, or the family or the those properties that have literally been intertwined twined with wine for centuries uh, is, is, is being affected a little bit by this, uh, uh, this, this reality of our, our health situation. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, there's things that, that I look forward to. And one of those things is having those big events and having some crab stuffed mushrooms available because we did uh, uh, a Pinot, we do a Pinot Palooza as a release every June as part of our wine club. And we feature three, three different Pinots in a rosé of Pinot. And uh, we, we won, one of the, interestingly enough, one of the times we did a crab kind of pairing. Another time we've done bacon, which is a, a fabulous way to pair, to pair a, a Pinot Noir as well. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that would be an absolutely incredible pairing with a wine like this. Oh, great. So from here, I'm going to move on to the Tillerman. This is, uh, uh, if, if I was going to say important as far as what we're known for, um, I don't think there's anything for this winery that is more important than the kind of the lore of the Tillerman. Um, so with the 2017, that's, that's part of the seller offer here. Um, this is a Cabernet Sauvignon based blend with Cabernet Franc Merlot. And then as we were talking about before, everybody else got on uh, just amongst us, what, what really makes this a proprietary blend and kind of puts our stamp on it is that little bit of Sangiovese that, uh, that we also blend back here. This is such a food appropriate and flexible wine. Um, I believe this was the uh, coffee crusted uh, uh, <laughs> steak. Yeah. <if> you're you're <laughs> listening. <laughs> That's a yeah. Coffee marinated grilled flank steak. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, there's notes of everything from... I think we're building a really good hook and ladder food pairing dinner here, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Start with the shard and, and the risotto, and then we'll go to the uh, we'll go to the pinot with the mushrooms, and then I think the flank steak. Mm, mm. So we're three we're three courses in, and I'm I'm still yeah. hungry. Uh, Devin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah with this hey there's point, kim chen devin kim chen oh, has a question yeah i'm i was wondering because uh, a lot of the members like the tittleman and the station 10 yeah. can you cause, and I, i'm reading the notes i'm reading the the gray varietals what makes the tittleman different than the station 10 
Yeah. It, like, if I have to choose among one of those two, what's like, what's the best and like, <laughs> which occasion, like I'm, I'm, I'm debating. Okay. So, so you're, you're basically saying, okay, we bought both of the wines, which is a great start. You want both of these wines. <laughs> and then we're talking about the actual choice when it comes down to the choice of, of the wine. Um, here, here's how I kind of look at this. I, I would say that, that when it comes to, to, to food and depending on what, what we're, we're, we're making, um, I would use that, that Tillerman maybe as the, the bottle that comes down on the table and, uh, and, and potentially the, the, the Zin blend, which is the station 10 as the, the bottle that, uh, either, you know, finishes off after you're just kind of sipping, um, or, or even, you know, prior to while you're making it, because it's such an accessible wine with that grapefruit forward aspect um, that, uh, that can make for very appropriate just sipping. So the big difference here, Kim Tien, is, is obviously varietally, uh, the components are, are going to be uh, quite drastically different with the Tillerman being cab based, as I said, with Cabernet Franc, Sangiovese and Merlot, whereas the Station 10 is Zinfandel forward. Uh, this particular offering, though, as I was talking about with Michael, is uh, more to my liking. The last year in 2016, if you guys got uh, that Station 10, that was a lot more of that upfront Zinfandel fruit uh, and, and probably was borderline on, on, on that 15% alcohol threshold. We don't want to get to that. Uh, so this one, I think, has a little more balance to it and has a great companion. The Zinfandel has a great companion in the Petite Syrah. Now, we also have a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon, um, uh, a little bit of Carignan, and, uh, and a varietal that stumped Michael. I was amazed that there was a varietal that he didn't know, uh, that he didn't even have in his thousand-bottle cellar. No, and that's it's true. That's Boucher, Alicante Boucher, a really fun, uh, fun wine that uh, that is known for color. It's a red fleshed varietal. So they're very different in the components that make them up, and then also where where they come from, right? We've talked about uh, you know the the reasons that make Russian River Valley special, and uh, the terroir, everything that's around them, the winemaking process to, uh, to to some of these wines. But what's really special about the Tillerman is it's our first foyer into Chalk Hill. Chalk Hill is the northeastern corner of the Russian River Valley. It is a sub-appellation. Uh, so you could still market this uh, if, you, if you wanted uh, as a Russian River Valley wine. However, Chalk Hill really denotes the fact that, uh, uh, that you, you have much more capability to get the type of uh, ripeness and, and, and richness that you, you would want for Bordeaux varietals. So if you want a context to where Chalk Hill is, its western border is with the Russian River Valley. Its eastern border is with Alexander Valley. And just, excuse me, its north border, northern border, is to, with Alexander Valley. And just to the east of it is uh, Knights Valley. And so both north and east, these are really, really legendary areas to grow Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot. Uh, I mean, Bordeaux varietals tend to thrive there. This is on the foothills of the Mayacamas that Chalk Hill becomes kind of a gateway into Alexander to the north or, uh, or of course, Nice Valley to the east. And, um, and for us, this is what, what luckily Cecil and Christine saw as a very uh, important part of their future with Deloach at the time and then eventually with what Hook and Ladder was. And they were able to acquire about 142 acres. We still have about 92 of them planted in Chalk Hill. And um, it's, it, it's, it's really everything but the Pinot and Char, right? So we have uh, Cabernet Sauvignon growing up there, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, uh, some Sangiovese, a little Petit Syrah. Um, these are all things that, that, that kind of, you know, for, for me, have kept me interested in this, this winery for 14 years, right? I, I think we have a diversity. We have an ability to make different wines. And then in the case of, uh, of something like the Tillerman and, and Station 10, you know, Jason uh, really is able to, to, to make blends that have a consistency and yet still a varietal, uh, or excuse me, a, a, a range from vintage to vintage because there's still small lots um, and, and, and pretty small production. So the Tillerman is personally one of my favorite wines. So if I was just going to say, hey, you know, what, what, am, I, what am I drinking, um, Station 10 or Tillerman on, on any given night, 
Um, especially with that flank steak, I'm going to take that, that, that Tillerman. But my wife really prefers the Station 10. Uh, she loves the accessibility, that depth in fruit. Uh, there's some really interesting, almost like clove spice that, that comes off uh, of, of this cooler climate Zinfandel. The, the problem with Zinfandel uh, in the Russian River Valley is just how long it takes. It can make for an incredible, incredible wine, but you usually have to take very low yields. Um, it can be a bit uneven in its ripening, and, uh, and it's, it's always the last thing to, to come off of the vine. And, um, and so you've you got to be patient to still grow Zinfandel in the Russian River Valley. There's not much of it left. Um, but I think that, that brings up an important historical context to Zinfandel in California. But Zinfandel, in even an area that isn't necessarily known for it um, in, in contemporary times, I, I would say Zin, if there was a, a flag that represented California wine in a historic sense, it would, it would have to be one of those gnarly old Zinfandel vines, those ones that are just untrellised and dry farmed. And that's what we're using in this Station 10. Um, I mean, we have two, two different vineyard sites that go into the Station 10 here, um, making up the Zin component. And that is the, uh, the, the Gamboji Ranch, which was planted in 1909, and the Marcucci Vineyard, which was planted in 1922. Now, the way that, that people made wine, especially back then, was, was really in a field blend st uh, a style. That's important, and, and these, there's going to be distinctions that kind of have a representation to, to harking back and, and putting a, a, a kind of a field blend wine together, but there's some significant things that I'll talk about that, that really don't make this a field blend. But if I was going to say conceptually what is the Station 10, I think there's a lot of that to it, right, is that we're making this kind of time-honored Italian field blend style wine with Zinfandel being right at the forefront and Petit Syrah and even some Alicante Boucher. Oftentimes back in the you know early 1900s, you might see some Toque. There might even be a couple white varietals in there. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously that's changed over the years. But uh, the big distinction that, that really makes this a proprietary blend that is 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 not done in a traditional field blend style is that these are not co-fermented, right? So the way they made wine back then was everything came off the vine at the same time. They all put it in for a co-fermentation process, and uh, and there's some really harmonious melding of flavors that can go on there too. However, there's also some uh, some things that, that that can happen as far as uneven uh, ripening process in that same vineyard. Some varietals obviously just just ripen with a, a different timeline than another. And so picking them all together from the same field can be problematic to overall wine quality. So in the way that we do the Station 10 and the Tillerman now, even though the Tillerman is still a single vineyard blend, uh, the, the Station 10 and Tillerman are, are actually put together by the winemaking team um, through barrel sampling. And then we, we essentially just manipulate those percentages to make the best wine that we can. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing being in the California wine game because uh, there's a lot of things that are just not, they don't hold true to old world wines or even to some winemakers thoughts on them, but they've become incredibly trendy. One of those things would be single vineyards. Um, single vineyards are really cool, like single vineyard pinots, and, and they can be a, a great representation of just this, this time and this piece of, uh, of the earth and, and the weather around it and the terroir that just makes it so singular. However, if you talk to most, most winemakers candidly, if, if you're saying what gives you the best potential to make the best wine, most of them are going to tell you they need more material than just one vineyard, right? And, or they need more material than just one varietal. So in the case of these blends, I mean, these are two of, uh, of our winemaker, Jason's, like, these are two of his favorite projects every single year. And it's because he feels like he can make, uh, you know, a really, really superior wine and to, and to it in a way that, that is truly kind of indicative of, of his stylistic approach. Really glad to hear that. I've, I've got a bit of a story when I was in France and you said you spent some time in France as well and went to a really small vineyard on a drive through Grave uh, down near Bordeaux. And there was one fellow who was saying, I make this wine with the, with the grapes that the world gives me. I don't care if they don't taste good if, as long as they reflect the terroir. <laughs> yeah, no thanks. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> 
I think you should make a good tasting wine, you know? But what a great, what a great idea. Uh, there's no doubt that I, uh, I, I, you know what, actually. You uh, met him. <laughs> there, there are some, there are some winemakers out here that, that don't necessarily, they just make whatever they want. But, but you have to make a good wine. And yeah. if you want to stay in business, for the most part, you have to make something that is accessible enough to sell. And, um, and, and that's, that, that's just true to the nature of, uh, of, of wine and business. But it is an amazing thing that some people are just so de defiant in that way. But yeah, the, 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 the fun part about really all of the wines that Opinion selects, and, and this is a credit uh, to Jane and, and her abilities as well, um, you know, these are a lot of, of the wines that, that we do have a little more, uh, um, you know, blending material that goes on, whether it be a true blend in the Tillerman and Station 10, or whether in, in say the Pinot Noir, this is multiple vineyard sources. Now we make single vineyards as well, um, but I always feel like some of the best juice that we can produce is through multiple vineyard sources. And then of course, uh, obviously we can spend a whole another session on the different clones, but um, this, this is a testament to, I think, the, the type of quality that you're getting in this offering from, from Opinion and, and, uh, and really the selections that are made every year. And I'm always excited to see what those selections are because they're not always, I mean, they're not always the same, right? I, they're, yeah. they're, they're driven by, um, by somebody's, uh, uh, you know, approach to, to their craft and, and recognizing the excellence in wine and then being able to provide that to the, the customer base. And, and I think that that's a, a, a pretty... A pretty cool thing and, and being at this winery for as long as I've been um, this is a cross-section of wine that that I I drink regularly these are these are wines that are are definitely wines that I've cellared that I continue to engage with it may not be with a uh, coffee marinated flank steak every night but not every night but uh, at least once a week though right yeah <laughs> now like, speaking of what was this station 10 we talked about some of the differences what was this station 10 uh, being paired with. I want to okay. know. Okay, that is a, a grilled venison tenderloin with blackberry sauce. Oh. So well. I don't know where, I guess we, I've often double lapped. I'm not sure I've ever double mained when I've had a dinner, but uh, just might on this one. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly right. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic, a fantastic pairing. And again, um, in honor of these blends, I'll, I'll remind you the tiller, the tillerman, the position that held on the back of a hook and ladder truck steering around those tight corners in San Francisco and uh, Station 10 which is Presidio and Bush in the Laurel Heights area of, of San Francisco so again these are, are two two wines that have a, 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 a real sentimental meeting to or meaning to uh, uh, Jason's grandfather uh, Cecil so uh, our head winemaker Jason Deloach is uh, carrying on you know the the family legacy uh he's done it with his own style but he still holds the the the, the context of uh his, his his grandparents as pioneers of this area in a very high regard so um it's a lot to to kind of live up to but uh, i think he's 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 done that really well and then also put some of his own uh, thoughts and stamps on our wine um, so the final wine that i'm going to to because you know I, I just went big here today i said i was going to try them all with you uh, I'm envious. <laughs> as the, uh, this is the, the Cabernet Sauvignon. This is all Chalk Hill as well. Now we do blend back Merlot into this cap. Really important to, to finding this to be um, as accessible as it is as a, a 2017. Many, many cabs at 2017, let's be honest. I, there's, they're hard to drink, let alone whether they have aging potential. They can be so tight, so tannic. Uh, have a really kind of, you know, strict acid. And, and those things can all make for really something that just puckers and isn't accessible um, in the bottle for years until years to come. I think that one of the things that, that is, is different about this is with some of that Merlot uh, blend back and uh, with the Chalk Hill area where we get such a great kind of blackberry and fruit essence to this wine, um, it makes for something that can be enjoyed right now. So if you are not somebody that wants to sell or uh, is not patient or doesn't see the reward that Michael does out of uh, putting a wine down for 10 years, um, that's okay. And you can drink this and enjoy this, this, this Cabernet Sauvignon. And that's probably one of the things that, that is it's different for me. I I, I must say, I mean, I, I drink a lot more P 
Pinot and blends than I do cab. If you went to my cellar, you'd probably think I was head over heels about cab. Um, and the, the reality is I just don't find, a, I, I like a lot of them. I just don't find a lot of them appropriate to, to, to drink until again, um, a certain amount of celery time. And this is one of those wines that yes, you could absolutely put this down for a decade, but you could pop this open the first, the first night that, that maybe wait a week after you, you get it from your club, but you know, the first night that when you get it in, uh, in the mail sent to you. So, um, that so, so while, while you're tasting there, Devin, I'll, I'll add that you're probably not aware of this either, is that Jane actually gives us a drinkability and a maturity date mm. and, and, the, and a drinking window as well. So for this cab, and, and typically we try and choose wines through Jane that, that are drinkable when they arrive, but that they, all, they also have some legs. So she's got that this is a maturity of six out of 10 and a, a drinkability of, of eight out of 10. And that the, the drinking window is 2020 to 2028, right? So that gives our members the chance to, to do that so that they know what, and what I typically do with wines of this caliber is I'll drink one upon arrival so I understand it. <laughs> and then put the other five down and drink them one, one a year until I want to leave one for a very long time, that sort of thing, so. I totally, totally agree with that. And that's, it, again, it's, it's such a cool, um, I, I love the selection process of the Opinion Society. I just think it's really, uh, I do a lot of these types of things and uh, we, we, we don't have, I, I think many, uh, many partners with our wine that, um, that, that scrutinize the wine in the way that, that Jane does and that, that the staff does to produce something of value for their members first. Obviously, they, they would love to sell a, a, you'd love to sell a bunch of our wine, and, uh, but, but I, I will honestly say, if, if we didn't produce the wine quality, we wouldn't be selected on any wines, let alone to have five. And that is, uh, that, that's just, to me, a different way of, of being proud, and not only about um, you know, what, what we do, but also, I think, a really distinct, way of of delivering value to uh to the folks that that are uh, are a part of of these selections so um this is a cabernet sauvignon that i absolutely will do on uh on special occasions and yet as he said i mean if it was a a bad day and i needed a a big wine um this this is this is definitely mature enough and, and drinkable enough that uh, you could you could pop it on open right now and you're doing the 17 there now Absolutely, I'm doing and, seven. And when did you open it, Devin? Did you did you let it breathe a bit, or just recently? I sure did. Yeah, I mean, and I would definitely say that in regards to. I just want to make sure I don't lose. And, and we we yeah we've lost. Oh, there you're back. Okay. Um, in regards to uh, uh, the, the the caps off, yeah, I mean, in a lot of these ones, but um, yeah, I opened this about six hours ago, so. Yeah. Uh, um, in anticipation of, of, of doing these these wines and honestly because I haven't tried a couple of these vintages um, in a little while uh, believe it or not I do not drink wine all day every day and keep up with uh, we have 30 SKUs so that's 30 unique wines that's uh, that's a lot of wine uh, so I, I, I do have two kids and I have to stay on my game here they're both under five so um, I can't come home completely red toothed every night uh, trying uh, the, the most the most current of uh, of one. But yeah, I, I did give this a little bit of an opportunity to breathe. I think that's a really good idea, especially with a cab like this. Um, if you have an aerator, if you have a decanter, that uh, that could work. Um, these are these are also ways that I think you know just getting this a little more comfortable um, to being open and then in the glass is is probably going to make for a better drink. You're, you're going to want to know the, uh, the pairing on this. Everybody's going to want to know this. Does everybody want to know this? Yes, everyone nodding, yeah. It's uh, Flintstone's ribeye with a red wine gastrique. Oh, jeez. So can you tell that, that, that actually a food writer uh, edits the, uh, the, the cellar offering? Incredible. That's... Uh, yeah. So yeah, so it, when I when, when I come up there, once once I come up there, is are you going to provide these these? Without offers? question, you bring the wine. <laughs> I will be providing the food. I will cook it myself for you, Devin. Fantastic! <laughs> yeah. uh, fantastic! So you know we've went through through the wines. I think uh, at this point, I mean, 
I, I would love to uh, to take any other questions that 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 may be at the top of mind from from anybody, uh, whether they be from opinion, whether they be from uh, the members. Um, I'm a pretty open book, so you know I, it can be uh, anything from my personal life to uh, the, the the family's history of uh, of wine here. No, I, you know honestly. Uh, whatever anybody wants to 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 to, to ask about, I'm I'm here, and if uh, if if I've covered it, that's fine too. Well, and I did notice that uh, Danielle did she wrote to us saying that she's there with her husband John, and they're from North Vancouver. So, welcome Danielle and John. Canucks fans? Are they Vancouver Canucks fans? Well, let, let's not go too far. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I tell you, I've been a Leafs loser for 25, 30 years. So, I, that, I, I know uh, I don't I don't know enough about you know these uh, uh, rivalries to to get too 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 far into them. But you know the West Coasters over there, and they're still are, are they still in it? I I, I was watching the oh, they, and, and they're actually saying they're Raptors. And no, the Leafs are long gone. Um, I don't no. know about the Canucks, but but Danielle and John are Raptors fans, which is oh. Toronto and. And I think they're down three to two, so they've got to win the next one before. Uh, uh, yeah, world champs, so. world champs, the Raptors. Yeah. They, they they beat my uh, my hometown beloved Warriors. I'm a huge basketball fan, and that was a tough one to take. But yeah, but uh, we we deserved it though, Devin, here. completely. Yeah. Yeah, it was well. It was, it was well deserved. <laughs> Raptors are just a fantastic fantastic organization. I think Nick Nurse is just an incredible coach. And uh, and really, and you they, want them, don't you, for the Warriors, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I don't know. Does anybody have any wine questions? Surely. Yes. Yes. But I don't know. I think we covered it all. I'm sorry I speak too so much, and obviously I'm a foodie, and and it's really important to me those food pairings, and and I have to say that your wines are just incredibly good with food like you said I, I would certainly sip the pinot on the, on the back porch um but but it also pairs really nicely with food too so um yeah well balanced are really the approach and and, yeah. uh, and that's what you get and oftentimes those those can really make for the best food opportunities and and some of these are, are pretty versatile but boy yeah you, you didn't uh you hit it right on the nose when it came with these pairings. These uh, these pairings, I'm going to go back, and I don't know what, what is going to be for dinner tonight, uh, but I, I think I'm going to be disappointed. And, and do you get one of these in the mail? I think we're mailing them now to everybody. So so it's all there, and you can just uh, take that to your favorite restaurant and tell them to cook it for you. Yeah, and if there is uh, no other questions, the one thing I really want to say to uh, to everybody, both both staff and supporters, is – uh, just, just you know, a, a big thank you. Uh, this has been a more challenging year in a lot of ways uh, for for you know the winery for for folks. I think you know worldwide, uh, but especially here uh, in California over the last couple of years with the effect on on tourism um, uh, and and some of these fires and what it, what it's meant there, and then of course COVID. So for us to be able to offer uh, you know something that we're so proud of that we, we put so much time and effort into and that we really uh, hope is, is, is just enjoyed by everybody that engages in it. It's, it's just an amazing thing to be able to, to offer that um, in an arena like this and to have people um, hopefully really enjoying the product that we provide. So I really thank you to all of the opinion members and uh, people that are interested in our wine, that have been in, enjoying our wine over the years, um, that are excited about this offering. Uh, and uh, and future offerings or, or past, I, I really really thank you for all of the support and uh, and I hope that you enjoy these wines. I really do. I see some people have uh, have opened up their mics, so I'm going to be quiet for a change. And... Well, I, I I just wanted to say thank you very much. It was uh, very interesting, and uh, uh, your wines sound wonderful, and the food pairings <laughs> <laughs> spectacular. <laughs> So well, well, David, get some of these on on order, and then I promise you, we'll do something in Stratford or Kitchener with those, and uh, oh, and we'll share them together. That sounds like a plan for sure. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you very much, uh, Devin, for your time. That's thank great. You.
All right. Well, I think we're going to let you go to your dinner, Devin. And we, we at Opinion thank you for your partnership and, uh, and the excellent wines that you provide. And, and it really is a feather in your cap that, that Jane continues to, to find uh, value in your wines. And, and uh, you're consistently great. And, and we're looking forward to a long, long uh, relationship. And, and I promise you that we will come and see you as soon as uh, travel is, is allowed. We'll, we'll put you on the list. I think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping to see you though, because I, I think everybody once travels allowed, we just want to get out, right? So let me come see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do a, an exchange. <laughs> that sounds yeah. good. Sounds we'll good. bill it you, you bill it us. <laughs> and oh. we'll, we'll talk We'll talk hockey and uh, and basketball and wine, of and course. And soccer too. He likes soccer too. <laughs> I like soccer sucker for sport and and, ah. and and wine and i mean come on they all they all uh they're all art uh so so, uh, so tfc's been doing well do you guys have a team in the in the north american league down there and soccer league in what we call the mls yes that that's the one yes um so the the the, the team that's closest to us is the san jose earthquake oh. i don't believe they are very good in fact they aren't um, the LA teams are, are typically powerhouses, uh, but as a nice knows, I also I follow very closely uh, European league football. Um, yeah. Saint Germain be... de Paris. Uh, yeah. Paris, Paris Saint Germain. No, it's not the good one. That's 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 not her team, and uh, for no. many people, many people in France, that's not their team, right? Like, no. I, I'm I'm a Paris snob though, so I'm okay. <laughs> All right, everybody, I, I, I'm I'm going to check out, and uh, I've already had dinner, but I think I'm going to go cook something anyway. <laughs> Thank you. I, so I've much. got I've got the station ten. I've got some left, so I guess I'm going to have the venison. Enjoy the wines. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you David. Any anything like that? All of my information is open, and uh, you can always uh, uh, give me a call directly. Uh, give me an email if you're ever out here. If you want to know something about the wines? We're happy to help. Um, but the opinion is the only way to get them in Canada. <laughs> right. Good job. Take care. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye bye. Bye.